to be unpacking our bags from 2015 and stuff that you put in that bag of 2015 and you continue to carry with you. We're going to unpack those things so that you do not have to carry it into the new year and have that be a burden to you. And you know, I think about how a new year, Bill is always making lists of things for the new year. He asks the Lord to give him new vision and heart and he makes lists of things that he's going to do and accomplish but then also there's this whole vision that the Lord will give him. He does that, he's done that as long as we have been together which is over 28 years now. We've been married 27 years and we were together even before that for a good year and a half, so we knew each other well when we got married. <laughs> but, um, but I always felt like I'm not gonna make resolutions, all I do is break them about February 2nd, and so I could just never bring myself to do the lists and do all that stuff. I'm the kind of person that lives today. Whatever's happening right now, this is where I am. Very difficult for me to, I can definitely work on the past, but I don't think about the future. I'm not someone who's like, I know what I'm gonna be doing in six months and five years and whatever, that whole thing just boggles my mind at times. And so, but Bill is, so he plans our lives for us, which is a blessing because if I was doing this, we would be living today and have poverty for the rest of our lives. <laughs> so thank God for Bill. Um, but you know, I want to help you this morning to unpack your baggage. Let's go through this together. There is nothing that is in your bag that is probably something I have not heard or seen before. And even more importantly is Jesus already knows what's in your bag. And so let's talk about that. Why are we gonna unpack it and then what are we gonna do with it? So what's in your bag? Let's talk about it. And that was such a great illustration of there are good things and there are some things that you are not meant to carry. So the good things, are there promotions in your bag? Are there, is there joy and peace and patience and kindness and good relationships and blessing? Is there the word of God and victory and perseverance? Have you surrendered to God? Do you have salvation and hope? Are you redeemed, renewed, refreshed? That's what the Lord wants you to have in your toolbox, in your bag, to go into 2016. And even with that, it's something that you need to understand that Jesus already is there. He's already gone before you. And so all of those good things are waiting for you in the next year. When we used to take road trips, as when, we were, when I was a kid, I'm one of five children, I'm the youngest. And so I was always in the way back. And so it's like, oh, we're coming upon a state line. Everybody get ready. So I'm like, I thought like when you cross from California to what's a neighboring state, Nevada, and um, it's fire hot and needles, wherever that is. I remember getting out of the car and like, you can't breathe. But anyway, when you cross that state line, I thought that it was gonna look totally different. And then I'm like, it looks just like California. What are we doing here? This is no different. And so I felt the same way about a new year. 2015 looks a lot like 2016 and vice versa. And so I didn't really see the significance in the new year and making resolutions and all that stuff because I didn't have the understanding of really what the Lord has to do with it. Is there in your baggage disappointment from this last year and maybe years before that you're carrying with you? Is there hurt, frustration, anger, pain, resentment, debt, loss, despair, hopelessness, loneliness, debt, broken relationships, weakness, sorrow, grief, abandonment, addictions, weight, heavy burdens, rejection, Lust, bondages, what's in your bag? God wants you today to be released of those things. He wants for you to be able to bring those things to the cross and lay them down today. And you don't have to carry those things anymore. A few months ago, I was, we, I was looking at a picture of our family together and I was sort of standing on the end and then you know the girls are in the middle and Bill's on the other side. I looked at this picture and I started looking like I was kind of like an ape, like my, 
my arms were like this in the picture. I was like, what in the world? That is looking like a freak. What am I doing? And so um, a very good friend of ours is here today, Lisa De Los Santos and her two children. And we miss her husband, Chris. Noah and Becca are here with her. And um, years ago, Lisa was helping me walk through some things in my life that I had not had victory in. And she was teaching me something very important that I had never heard before, and that was about posture, which I knew about posture, but I didn't know this trick. Some of you military people will know this, maybe. And so she said, you know, when you stand in the mirror, you want to be able to see your thumbs this way, right, Lisa? And so your shoulders are back. You're, you know, you have like a rod through your spine. I'm modeling for you. Isn't that beautiful? And, um, and you, know, you know, you want everything to be in line. Well, Clearly, I was literally like this, so all these muscles were just tight in here, and I started realizing this is a reflection of my physical body is reflecting my spiritual life and emotions, my mind, what was happening, and Bill, too, we would wake up, and we're all in pain, our back, our knees, and all this weird stuff, and I'm like, this is way too early for this. We've got to stop this. But literally, there were things that were so burdening our hearts and minds that our physical bodies were beginning to reflect that to where we couldn't stand upright. And how are you going to be effective in ministry to receive or give if you're in a posture that is downward? Your head goes down, everything's in pain, you can't turn properly. And so, I felt like, you know what, I've gotta do something about this. I feel like the Lord is really convicting me. I could, I could not sleep at night. There were just some things that were like, three huge things that were happening at one time. My, our daughter, Taylor, got in an accident. The very same weekend, something huge happened that was harming relationship with my family, my, my mom and sisters type family, and dad. And then another relationship being broken, and I was just like literally more and more and more and more just, you know, carrying that burden. And so the Lord was, I was trying to give it to him. Every night I would pray, God, just help me not to worry about this anymore. Help me to release that to you. But I didn't really know how. I'd wake up thinking about it, and we would talk about it all day. We'd process these things, and taking Taylor to the doctor every day. And, you know, you feel your children's pain. When she got in the car accident, Bill and I both were, the next morning, we woke up totally in pain as if we had been hit by a car on our right side, both of us. So weird. And so, and that's where she got hit, her shoulder, her ribs and all that, hand, arm. And so then I was, you know, struggling, struggling, struggling. God, please take this from me. Help me. Whatever. And really not getting through it. So we were processing. We were talking about it. We're trying to figure out a way through this relational challenge that we were having and challenges. And, and, and we are so relational that when there's break in relationship and when there's hardship in relationship, we want to fix it. We cannot live with that whatever that is, that stress or that struggle in relationship because it's just a high value to us. But there were things that we had no control over. And so I felt like the Lord said to me, Lisa, I need you to fast for this one because I want to do something greater in you than these circumstances. It was a bigger issue in my heart than those. Those were circumstances. But there was something deeper going on that the Lord wanted to deal with. And so... He was like, okay, what do you want me to fast? So I asked the Lord, first of all, what can I do? I need help. I can't do this by myself. I've tried, I've processed, I've processed, I've processed, and we've talked and talked and talked. We're exhausted. You can't process some things away, right? You can't just talk some things through and be better because they're out of your control. If there's someone who breaks relationship with you, and you want to mend that relationship, but they choose not to, what can you do about that? You can take it to the cross, and you can pray for them. And I would try to do that, you know, and I was like, like I had this big backpack of baggage on, and I'm like, this is me, I'm bearing my burden and and taking it to the cross, and I'll walk over to Jesus, and I'll pray, God, see my burden? I still feel the burden. 
Jesus, look at this. Isn't this awesome? I've got this great burden. He's like, give me your burden. Lay it down. And until you can take that and ask the Lord to help you, you're just showing it to him. You're making a little wish list. It's not like a a little genie. I wish I didn't have this burden. No, it takes something, an action of surrender to bringing it to the cross. And so for me, I had to I had to act upon it and I had to ask the Lord to help me. And so for me, I felt like it was to fast things that I go to that are very natural, that I enjoy, and that aren't good for me, frankly, and cause me physical pain in my body. So I gave up some things that I ingest, so things like coffee, that if I'm tired, I don't feel tired anymore. It's amazing. (laughs) You should try it some, maybe you shouldn't. Um, (laughs) Actually, there's nothing wrong with coffee, but for me, it's where I would go if I'm tired. That is a lot of coffee every day. And then sugar, it just makes me feel better. I'm sorry, I like sugar. But it doesn't make me feel better. It makes me feel terrible, like a lot of pain in my knees, my back, whatever. And then white flour, I know it's, whatever, a gluten-free age, let's just all be gluten-free. So I joined the party, but I'll do wheat, like, you know, whole grain stuff, but I felt like, okay, it's sugar, coffee, white flour, white rice, just to throw it in there, I don't really like it anyway, so I'll fast that, that's just making it easier. And then deep fried foods, so you think, okay, not too difficult, I'm not doing a whole 30, it's not a diet, I'm not trying to get anybody to join me. It was literally what I felt the Lord was saying for me, to be able to be open to hear what he's saying, to show me the differences between what is me kind of self-medicating or or comforting myself rather than having the Lord do that. I know that sounds so stupid and weird when I'm standing up here saying that, but in my heart it makes a lot of sense, so hopefully this will make sense to you. For you it might be something totally different that the Lord would use, but we'll talk about those things in a few minutes. So we're unpacking our bags today and we're going to ask the Lord to help us. So God is meant to carry the things that you cannot change. Those are the things that Jesus came for so that you don't have to bear those burdens, so that you don't have to carry that. Does it mean that it makes your life perfect and easy and feel great? Let me tell you what it means. For me, taking those things out of my daily living, coffee, sugar, flour, all that stuff, I felt miserable for a few days. Such bad headaches all day long. By the way, when you fast, you think, oh, every time I open the Bible, I'm just gonna hear from the Lord because my channels will be so clear. No, (laughs) actually, all the junk comes to the service and you get really, really angry or if you're angry or you get really, really frustrated and anxiety if you're that kind of person or you get so tired if you're a depressed person, you just go to bed, don't talk to anybody. If you're self-pity, you talk about it all day long. I'm fasting, it's so hard. Just let me tell you how hard it is. So it's whatever is in you begins to surface that's not meant to be in you. Not only that, your body physically, so that's talking about like spiritual and emotional stuff. Physically, I was in so much pain, I couldn't sleep. My legs were like totally cramping, horrible pain for an entire week. Like I couldn't sleep at night, I'm just massaging my legs, praying God that they would get better. And it's all that just toxins that your body is absorbing over time. Well, if that's our physical body, So we go to fast and we think spiritually it's just gonna be this big enlightenment that the Lord just fills us with instantly. But I would wanna tell you just as a warning that actually it's very similar to your physical body that all that spiritual stuff that needs to come out gets shifted to the top so that it can be taken out and left at the cross. And so don't be afraid of it. Don't be worried that if you step into that, like I don't want that pain, I'm not doing that. Yeah, well we'll talk about that in a minute. So there are some things that are meant for you to do something about, and there are many things that you can do nothing about. Maybe you've been praying, 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 there's no answer. You take it to the cross and you leave it there. There's no answer. You pray and pray and pray more. You've left it at the cross. Oh, 
I guess I can't trust him, I'm just gonna go and pick it back up. And you carry that burden with you again and again. And so sometimes, for me, I have to take it to the cross oh, hourly. <laughs> okay, God, I give this to you, I cannot change it. It's causing me anxiety, it's causing me pain, I'm hurt, my feelings are hurt. I'm getting resentful and I do not wanna be bitter, so I'm just gonna leave it at the cross. I wanna read some scriptures to you that will help you as you are unpacking your baggage. Hebrews 12, verses one through three says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, oh, sorry, I skipped one, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's so interesting. I went through a season in my 30s that was really challenging. Like I told you before, I'm one who lives in the moment, Right now, I'm standing up here, this is what I'm doing, and I'm not really thinking about anything else and haven't really even thought too far ahead of right now. But that's a shock when you get married and then you have three little children that you never really thought about how you were gonna do all of that ahead of time. And so I hit the 30s and I was like, who am I and what am I doing? I have to take care of these three children, not only that, but raise them to be godly women. Oh, and by the way, be a great wife, perfect wife, and because that's what everyone expects of a pastor's wife, right? Oh, burden, showing the cross, there it is. <laughs> but really, the Lord wants to take those things from you, and so you don't carry them, and I was carrying them, so much so that it began to mess with my spiritual walk with the Lord, because I didn't trust that he had something better for me. That if I took those things to the cross, temptation, struggle, um, I don't know, expectations even, I wasn't sure that if I gave those things to Jesus that he had something better for me. Because some of those things, we wrap it in a gift and make it look all pretty like it's something that makes us happy and comforts us and all of that. But in truth, it's very destructive. And so rather than taking it to Jesus, I decided I'm gonna go with it myself and isolate myself from help and isolate myself from the Bible. I'm not gonna ask Jesus about this because I am sure he's gonna <laughs> beat me because that's what Jesus does, right? No, but we're so afraid to take our things to the Lord because the Bible is then, it's like, whoa, it's, gonna, it's probably gonna really let me have it. The Lord's gonna say things that are gonna really make me hurt because I'm being bad. I'm making wrong decisions. Oh, and by the way, I knew better. So you kind of row out into the ocean with your little dinghy, you know, your paddles, you get out in the middle of the sea, there's no light, it's dark. Oh, and let's just throw out the oars so there's really no chance to get back. And then you realize, wait, there is light, and it's that moon shining on the sea. But you don't know what's coming, you're on your own. The only light that, that I could see in that place in my life was like the moon, which is a reflection of the sun. There is no other light that comes from the moon outside of reflecting from the sun, right? And that's like Jesus in our lives, that he is the light of our lives, that we, we have no light outside of him. We reflect the light of Jesus. And so if we don't have Jesus, there's really only darkness. And so Jesus wants to be reflected in your life. He wants to be there for you. But if you're rowing out into the middle of nowhere and being isolated, like I tended to do at that time, it's disappointing. And so when I actually came back to the Lord and I said, I need help, I went to the end of that story of where I was going and there was a storm coming. Remember, it's a dinghy in the ocean, it's dark and there's no oars. This is when you need Jesus' help. These are things out of your control. And so it was this moment of recognizing that I am, I am completely in the hands of God. He needs to rescue me. I need salvation. And that is when I went to the word of God finally. I wrote out my whole story 
Let's see at the end of the road with every decision continuing down that path of ungodliness or hurt or bitterness or whatever it might be for you, loneliness or debt or loss or despair, hopelessness. What's at the end of that road? Why not bring it to the cross? If you go to the end of the story, continuing on the path that is destructive, the end of the story is still destruction. It doesn't change along the way if that's the path you're on. The only change and the only way that there can be salvation from that destruction is something to intervene. So there are two things that the Lord wants to do today, and that is for you to bring those things to the cross and also to bring change in your life so that you won't continue down that path of destruction. And so as I open the word of God in that season of difficulty and struggle, it wasn't what I thought it would be. It wasn't like, oh, you sinner, you're going to hell, which is the scripture I was sure I was gonna open up to. Instead, it was, there is nothing that can separate you from my love. Neither height, nor depth, nor things in the past, or the present, or things to come. Nothing can separate you from God's love. And that's what this Matthew says, he's gentle and humble in heart. He wants to restore you. He does discipline us and it hurts, just like the fasting and the detoxing and all that stuff. It is not easy, but it is worth it. Let me read another scripture to you that says what I was about to read, and that is Hebrews 12, one through three. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So Jesus did all of that for us. He didn't do it just to prove something. He did it so that you wouldn't grow weary and lose heart. He did it to give you eternal life, to give you salvation. And so when we continue to carry our burdens, we're on our own. When we are not taking those things that we cannot change to the cross, we become changed by them. They hinder us. They keep you from having freedom. They keep you from having joy. They keep you from having peace. They keep you from favor. They keep you from that long lost love that you wish you had. They keep you from the fulfillment of the promises and the dreams that are in your heart and even from God. Because when we are on our own carrying our burdens, they hinder us from running the race. What is the race? The race is being Christ-like. That's our, that is our goal, that is our desire to be like Jesus, to be in the presence of our Lord and one with him. And so when we're like, you know, I wanna be like Jesus, but I also wanna do all this stuff, or I still wanna hang on to this identity because I don't know anything outside of that identity, that's all you're gonna know because Jesus won't, we can't do both. We can't hang on to all of it and be free, right? I love this prayer that, um, you know, they use it a lot in, like 12 step programs and, and with addictions and things like that, but it's, it's so good for every um, season of life, I believe, and it's by Reinhold Niebuhr, and it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to th- change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. Isn't that perfect? So it's saying that we should be able to accept the things that we cannot change. Those are the things that we take to the cross. You cannot do anything about it. You never knew your father. You cannot change that. Bring it to the cross. 
you've been rejected and that person is not willing to bring restoration, you can't do anything about that. You can pray for them and leave it at the cross. There are so many things that happen to us that we tend to feel like, it's my responsibility to fix this. Because after all, I know how to do things and I have a Bible and I'm a Christian, therefore my life should be perfect and I should make it that way. Yeah, not really, nope. Because Jesus talks about, or the Bible talks about how it is in our weakness that Jesus makes us strong. So today what we're going to do is we're going to ask the Lord for help for those things you cannot change. Those things that are big hindrances, their burdens that you have been carrying, that you are not meant to carry, and this is what we're going to do. We're gonna ask God to help us. I wanna read to you from Psalms 37, verse five. And it says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. Commit your way to the Lord, take it to the cross, Trust in him, leave it there, and he will act. So those things that I was carrying, those heavy things that were a burden to me, that I couldn't sleep over, I woke up thinking about all those things, all of a sudden, like, two, like a week later, maybe two weeks later, I wasn't thinking about those things anymore. And do you know what? I didn't even think about the fact that I wasn't thinking about those things anymore. And that's the thing with burdens and pain that you're not meant to carry. As soon as it's better and as soon as it's gone, you don't think about them. You're not meant to be in pain. You're not meant to live with bitterness. And so when it's gone, it's actually much more natural for us because we are made in the image of Christ. And so it's like Taylor's arm. Once her arm started moving, she didn't think about it. I heard her in the kitchen dropping stuff and whatever because she, she didn't feel as much pain. I'm like, what is going on in there? She goes, I kind of forgot my arm doesn't work. She's trying to make shakes and there's like ice cream falling, cups, everything she picked up I think fell on the floor too. But, but she wasn't feeling that same pain and so she was just doing things without thinking about it. Before that, she wouldn't move her arm. She couldn't sleep with her arm any certain way. And so... It's so much more natural for you not to be in pain. If you've ever had a broken limb that heals, when it heals, you kind of forget. You don't really think about it until it gets cold. Okay, moving on. <laughs> kind of ruined my illustration there. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, nine through 10 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's Paul writing from the prison. That's not me standing up here talking about someone hurt my feelings. That is Paul chained in prison and in a horrible situation, writing those things. In my weakness, I am strong. That Jesus comes into that very place that we try to hide from him or we just pray that he'll take it away and look at it, but really we don't give to him. He's saying, give it to me. That is the best gift that you can possibly give me is your worst stuff. Because that's when I can then come into that place and act on your behalf. And until you can do that, it's a burden you bear. It's a burden that you carry. So then there's this next thing. So there's the stuff you can't do anything about, and then there's the stuff that the Lord would call you to do a job, to have responsibility. What is that? So the wisdom to know the difference between the things that we can change and the things that we can't. So God, what is my responsibility? For me, God called me to that fast. What is it for you? What are the things that he might ask of you to do? Some of the things I'm gonna um, just list them off. This is not comprehensive. This is just, these are just ideas. Some things might require fasting, taking a time to focus on the Lord and what he would do that you cannot do by yourself or through your willpower. Other things might require going to someone to make things right. Restitution. Asking forgiveness, saying you're sorry. That's hard. That's scary. Other things might require a change in relationships or a job 
or the atmosphere and influences in order to get away from toxic or tempting people or places. Some things require hard work and perseverance. My posture didn't just change because I wanted it to change. Every morning, Bill knows, every morning and every night, I lay on the floor and do all these stretching exercises and stand up and Lisa taught me some stretches too that I can do for my posture. And I practice posture. It was so hard at first, like my rib cage hurt, my neck hurt. I was like, how is it so hard to stand up straight? That should be normal, but it isn't. Not when you're carrying burdens and not when you are stressed. And so for me, every day it was hard work and perseverance until then it becomes more natural and it feels better actually. Oh, the other thing that I noticed in another picture was like I had some big hump back here growing. I don't want that. And so once again, that has to do with posture and carrying stress that you're not meant to carry. And so some things require a renewed mind, changing your thinking to put on the mind of Christ and defeat the enemy with spiritual warfare. That's kind of like three things in one. So you're gonna change your thinking and also you've gotta battle some things, spiritual battle, taking it to the Lord but also defeating the enemy and telling him where he needs to go because you have to act. You are in a battle, not against your sister, your mother, your boyfriend, your husband, your children. You are in a battle that is spiritual and the enemy would love to destroy you. And he does not win in the end, no matter what. Jesus already won and we will win because we have Jesus, amen? And so I wanted to read this little story about a lady that changed her thinking, the 92-year-old Petite, well-poised, and proud lady who is fully dressed each morning by eight o'clock with her hair fashionably coiffed and makeup perfectly applied, even though she is legally blind, moved to a nursing home today. Her husband of 70 years recently passed away, making the move necessary. After many hours of waiting patiently in the lobby of the nursing home, she smiled sweetly when told her room was ready. As she maneuvered her walker to the elevator, I provided a visual description of her tiny room, including the eyelet sheets that had been hung on her window. I love it, she stated with the enthusiasm of an eight-year-old having just been presented with a new puppy. Mrs. Jones, you haven't even seen the room yet. Just wait. That doesn't have anything to do with it, she replied. Happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. Whether I like my room or not does not depend on how the furniture is arranged. It's how I arrange my mind. I already decided to love it. It's a decision I make every morning when I wake up. I have a choice. I can spend the day in bed recounting the difficulty I have with parts of my body that don't work very well anymore, or get out of bed and be thankful for the ones that do. Each day is a gift, and as long as my eyes are open, I'll focus on the new day and all the happy memories I've stored away just for this time in my life. She went on to explain, old age is like a bank account. You withdraw from when you, uh, you withdraw from what you've put in. So my advice to you would be to deposit a lot of happiness in the bank account of memories. Thank you for your part in filling my memory bank. I'm still depositing. And with a smile, she said, remember the five simple rules to be happy. Number one, free your heart from hatred. Number two, free your mind from worries. Number three, live simply. Number four, give more. And number five, expect less. And it's so incredible to me that is so simple and so true that we have a way of thinking. You might look in the mirror and think one thing or you look at your past and you think one thing and every time that you have that thought, there's a train of thinking that your mind goes on and it just heads down that direction. But what is God's thinking? He wants to go ahead in that place to prepare you how 2016 will be. And you don't have to go down that same track of thinking. The Lord wants to renew your mind so that you are having the mind of Christ. Um, so in taking these things to the cross, talking about the stuff that we cannot change, right? All that stuff that burdens, that we carry. I wanna read this scripture to you. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. 
For care, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And so these are the, some of the, this is actually dealing with some of the stuff that we can have part in, that, that humility, that God is asking us to walk in humility, and it requires something of us. That's not easy. And so he says to bless and not curse, live at harmony with with people as, as much as you can, depending on you. First Peter 5, verses five through 10, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that, that he may be lifted up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the grace of, and the God of all grace who called you to this eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I didn't used to really like that scripture, humble yourself, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he will, he will exalt you in due time. I thought that humbling part sounded really terrible. <laughs> But when you understand that it's humbling yourself under God's mighty hand, that means that he covers you. So if you are going and you're acting upon the things that God is asking you to do, you're doing the things that you're in out of obedience to the Lord, you're covered. It doesn't mean it won't be painful, it doesn't mean that, it, that you won't have to walk through some stuff, but it means that you're covered under his mighty hand, that in due time, it might take a little while, in due time, that he will, exhaust, he will exalt you, he won't exhaust you. He will exalt you, and so that, then it says to cast all your cares on him, because he cares for you. And then um, Philippians 1, verses 19 through 20, 21 says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 3, verses seven through 11 says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So there's a theme there. We can't gain without loss, with a spiritual law. We have to lose our pride, we have to lose ourselves in order to gain the hope of our salvation, to gain our future, to gain peace, to gain joy. We have to lose all the stuff we carry, those things that hinder us. And also to live as Christ and to die as gain. Once again, in order to live, we must die. It's so opposite of the world's thinking. We think that it's, it's something that we have to do to live, but really, we lay ourselves at the feet of Jesus, and he's the one who gives us life. It's in Christ that life comes. And the last scripture that I wanna read to you this morning, and then we're gonna, um, we're gonna try and exercise together. And it's not for your physical posture, it's for your spiritual posture. Isaiah 53, four through six. Surely he hath borne our griefs, this is a King James Version, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Jesus already took it for you. He wants to carry your sorrows. He wants to carry your burden. And he wants you to bring it to him to do that. He's not going to take it from you necessarily, but he wants you to come to him for help and to bring it to the cross. cross, cross.